I was going to try to combine the last two people on the tier list into one video, but I think it's better to split them up and really give respect to today's subject matter. If you have watched the recent documentary Keep Sweet, or if you keep up with Mormon polygamous news, you probably already know a lot about this. So I will try to talk about a few things you can only find in the autobiographies of former members, because I've read a lot of them. And I will leave a list of books down below if you want to learn more. Researching Warren Jeffs is an emotionally taxing thing. This is not one of those stories where all the victims are freed in the end. There are so many tragic endings and wasted lives in Warren's wake. Some have gotten out and found new lives, but many never have. Some were born after Warren took power and have never known anything else. Even if they have escaped, many have been left with the scars of a lifetime of abuse. Warren destroyed families, ripped children from their mother's arms, and sent men off to live lives of endless toil, thousands of miles away from home while their wives and children were given to other men. But is there more to the story than just a power-hungry despot? Is Warren Jeffs a one-off enigma, or has the history and practice of fundamentalist Mormonism made a figure like Warren Jeffs all but inevitable? Warren Steed Jeffs was born on the 3rd of December 1955 to Father Rulon Jeffs, who we talked about in a previous video in this series, and one of his plural wives, Marilyn Steed. Warren was born two months premature, and his first days of life were a struggle to survive. Relatives recall that Marilyn came from a family that was known to suffer from visions and delusions, something which many FLDS members saw as a sign of God's inspiration. The fact that Warren survived his premature birth was seen by the unstable Marilyn as a sign that he was God's chosen prophet on the earth. Right. Unlike the isolated families in Short Creek, Warren was raised near Salt Lake City, living a more comfortable and conventional life. Rulon could afford a more luxurious lifestyle than most of the FLDS. Having this understanding of the outside world while most followers did not was something I believe Warren would use to his advantage in the years to come. Warren's siblings believed that his early health problems resulted in him receiving more attention and love from their father. Rulon, who was already gaining power in the FLDS when Warren was born, was generally a distant father figure. Some of his children and grandchildren recalled that they were lucky if they got a handshake or a hug once in a while. Individual attention was nearly impossible to come by with Rulon. However, Warren's fragile health meant that Rulon had to spend more time focused on his infant son, and I suspect that this extra attention grew into a genuine affection and love. Nothing makes a child more precious than believing you could lose them. Rulon was not immediately convinced that Warren was the chosen one, however. Some saw Warren's mother, Marilyn, as a woman inspired by God, but others believed she was just mentally unwell. She was said to have visions, or perhaps delusions, and Warren would eventually have similar symptoms. Marilyn was convinced these visions were divinely inspired. She worked hard to convince her husband that he should invest time into Warren. In Rulon's presence, young Warren was pious, reverent, and devoted to scripture. He took full advantage of his close relationship to his father, becoming the favorite son of the favorite wife, a coveted position when your father is one of the leaders of the church. If you asked Rulon or Marilyn, they would probably tell you that Warren was a blessing from the Lord. His siblings tell quite a different story, however. They remember Warren as an obnoxious, spindly little tattletale and brown noser who was the first to report any misbehavior to their father, though he often broke Rulon's rules himself. From a young age, he could be manipulative and even vindictive if his siblings did not do what he told them to. Up to this point, I actually feel a little bit sorry for Warren. I'm sure he was desperate for love and attention in a family with dozens of children. Having gotten a dose of his father's love as a baby, it's kind of only natural that Warren's personality developed around the goal of keeping his father's love and attention focused on himself. Unfortunately, I think his mother added fuel to the fire by encouraging Warren's maladaptive behaviors. My opinion is that more attention for Warren meant more status for Marilyn, so she encouraged it. At age 21, Warren became the principal of the FLDS-run Alta Academy, which was a private school just outside Salt Lake City, created to keep the group's children out of the public school system. This was where his reign of terror first began. The luckier students remember Jeffs as strict and menacing. He would walk up behind students and whisper things like, Are you keeping sweet or do you need to be punished? The less lucky children suffered horrific acts of physical and sexual violence. I won't go into details, but the information is out there. Warren even preyed on members of his own family, including his own nephew. Those very nephews would eventually help to bring their uncle down, but as children, they were powerless against their uncle's sadistic abuse. Both in the Alta Academy and in the church, Warren gave 
endless monotone sermons during which he droned on and on about topics including obedience, church history, polygamy, blood atonement, and how the wicked world will soon be swept away by a vengeful God. His motto was that perfect obedience produces perfect faith, which produces perfect people. We will have no excuse now. From this moment on, the Lord and the prophet expect us to keep sweet. And the perfection of keeping sweet is the prayer of gratitude and rejoicing. Oh my God, I am so bored! Ah! Even in suffering, thank the Lord for the experience and keep sweet. In 1986, thanks to Uncle Roy adopting the one-man doctrine, Rulon Jeffs became the leader and prophet to the FLDS. Since Warren had a close relationship with Rulon, men were eager to marry their daughters to him so he could bend the prophet's ear on their behalf. Warren amassed a large family with many wives and children. In the mid-1990s, Rulon began to suffer a series of health issues. He was in his 80s, after all. The older and frailer Rulon became, the more Warren was seen by his side. Rulon would eventually lose much of his power of speech after a series of strokes, and Warren began to insert his own rules and doctrines, claiming to be his father's mouthpiece and proxy. Rulon had preached that he was the one mighty and strong who would rule until Jesus returned to wipe the unworthy from the earth. Warren used this belief to torment his followers, insisting that it was their disobedience and unworthiness which was making Rulon so sick. He assured them that Jesus would eventually restore Rulon to youth and health, but they would need to sacrifice more to prove that they were worthy of it. During his father's long final illness, he continued to marry off girls to the dying prophet. It did not escape other men's notice that he seemed to be picking the prettiest and most obedient of the girls from each family. When Rulon finally died in 2002, Warren told the other high-ranking leaders in the church, quote, hands off my father's wives. He married all but two of them later that week. I am shocked. Shocked. Well, not that shocked. There was a little resistance to Warren's takeover. Many had assumed that longtime Bishop Fred Jessup would become the next leader. Known as Uncle Fred, Jessup was already 91 when Rulon died. Accounts differ about what happened next, but many believe that Warren, feeling threatened by the elderly leader, excommunicated Jessup and held him in an undisclosed location until his death in 2005. Warren's attorneys claim that Jessup merely retired and didn't comment on whether he had been a threat to Warren's leadership. After expelling Winston Blackmore from the church, or did Winston leave on his own, Warren held leadership without challenge, and this made him a very wealthy man. His position gave him control of the United Effort Plan, or UEP, which meant he had access to hundreds of millions of dollars in assets. It was through this trust and with the help of a few loyal men in the church who would come to be known as the God Squad that he took control. The God Squad were an intimidating group, many of them officers of the law, who would patrol the streets of Short Creek looking for runaway girls to bring home or disobeying boys to kick out. Warren initially promised that Rulon would be miraculously restored to life and youth if his followers were holy enough. When that obviously didn't happen, he began to express that he did not feel that most members of the FLDS in Short Creek were worthy of the return of Rulon or Christ. The already strict rules began to tighten, sometimes in bizarre ways. Women already wore long prairie-style dresses that covered them from neck to toe, but now they could only be made in dull, monotone colors. He restricted the hairstyles permitted by both men and women. In time, he would ban a number of things, including toys for children, any type of outside media like TV or movies, and even the color red for some reason. Probably the worst thing he ordered was the removal of all family dogs kept as pets. The dogs were supposedly brought to the edge of town and killed. What an asshole! I won't go into any further details for my own mental health, but it was a traumatizing experience for the people involved. Supposedly. Allegedly. The rules were strictly enforced with the help of the God Squad. There are countless stories of boys as young as 12 or 13 who were literally driven out of town and dumped on the side of the road for infractions as small as listening to worldly music or having a crush on a girl. Warren was sadistic enough that he often made the boys' own mothers inform them that they were no longer part of the family. 
Known as the Lost Boys, they have little real education or life skills and have been taught since birth that the outside world is evil and will seek to destroy them. Believing they are already damned for being excommunicated, many boys turn to drugs, crime, or even worse. The rate of suicide among Lost Boys of the FLDS is staggering. It did not escape the notice of the women in the FLDS that the practice of polygamy relied on the ejection of most men. Since each righteous man was to have at least three wives, there could never be a balance between the genders. Some men did stay and were known as eunuchs. Often these men were sent away for years on labor missions all across the United States. Some are still out there making money for the FLDS and waiting until Warren deems them worthy to have wives and families. According to one former member, some of those men are in their 50s and 60s and are still waiting for a call that will never come. Thanks to the one-man doctrine, Warren had full power to marry couples, but also to punish men by taking their wives and children away. Warren did so with reckless abandon and even began separating mothers from their young children. There is a book written by Sarah C. Allred called Give Me Back My Children, which details what it is like to be a mother who was impacted by Warren Jeff's cruelty. If you want to know more, I do recommend it, but I caution you first because it is absolutely heartbreaking. Sarah's book shines a light on the formation of Jeff's inner circle, those he believed to be worthy. Unsurprisingly, attractive young girls and women were most often being found worthy, while their fathers, older mothers, and brothers generally were not. At first, the worthy continued to live with their families, but attended secret meetings with information they were not allowed to share with the unworthy. Naturally, this bred distrust between family members. I suspect that severing family bonds was one of Warren's goals with these measures. If a woman was found worthy while her husband was not, she and her children were moved to a new home and were given as a wife to a worthy man. It is impossible to overstate the emotional damage that was done to the hundreds of families impacted by these actions. Some have even called his actions a crime against humanity, and I agree with that. Warren destroyed many, many lives. Warren is said to have taken around 87 wives, but it is difficult to be sure. In the years before his arrest, Jeffs became an elusive figure moving from place to place to conduct sealing ceremonies with girls who grew younger and younger. He sometimes made other men complicit in his hebophilia by marrying a man's young daughter while simultaneously sealing that man to a child bride of his own in highly secretive ceremonies. There is evidence that Jeff married girls as young as 12 years old. And when I say evidence, I mean photographic evidence and audio recordings, which include very clear proof that these marriages were not just consummated, but consummated with other people, usually other wives, in the room and participating. There are recordings of these things out there, but I really, really don't recommend that you look into those. They are absolutely horrific. You could be traumatized from listening to them. The biggest project that Jeffs undertook with his UEP money was the purchase of a piece of land in El Dorado, Texas. Texas tends to be very permissive when it comes to groups expressing their religious freedom, so it was the place Jeffs selected to build the Yearning for Zion Ranch. Yeah, if your mind went straight to Jim Jones, you're not alone. The name concerned a lot of people. Warren displayed very strange behavior while directing the construction of the compound. He claimed that God gave him a special recipe to make the concrete for the ranch, but when the FLDS worker bees tried to create it, they were unable to make it work. Warren raged that it was because his people were being disobedient behind his back, and that was why it wasn't working. It starts to become apparent that when Warren's so-called revelations from God proved to be inaccurate, he would either claim that it was just a test or say his followers were somehow to blame for changing God's mind. I guess he eventually let them use building materials that worked because the ranch was completed and had a dedication ceremony on New Year's Day 2005. This was also the last time Warren was seen in public for quite a while. In the summer of 2005, the state of Arizona filed charges against Jeffs for marrying an underage girl to an adult against her will. Less than a year later, the state of Utah filed charges against Jeffs for felony rape of a minor, and this earned him a spot on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. Warren hit the road with his favorite wife, Naomi Jessup, and just a few close companions. He traveled around the country, staying in the homes of various FLDS members who not only housed him, but gave him large sums of cash. While he demanded that his followers give up music, holidays, birthdays, card games, toys, and even family ties, Warren lived the high life. 
He and Naomi rode motorcycles, visited casinos, and had expensive dinners while visiting tourist attractions. Occasionally, he would show up in Short Creek unannounced to conduct sealing ceremonies and, of course, collect more cash. When Warren Jeffs was finally apprehended during a routine traffic stop on the 28th of August, 2006, he was found with 16 cell phones, multiple computers, disguises, and $55,000 in cold, hard cash. He, wife Naomi, and his brother Isaac were wearing shorts and t-shirts and were driving a Cadillac that was the forbidden color of red. He was eventually found guilty of crimes both in Utah and Texas. Texas sentenced Warren to a life sentence for the rape of two minors, a conviction he is still trying to appeal to this day. As it stands, he will be eligible for parole in 2038, when he will be 83 years old. Most believe that Warren is still running the FLDS from prison. He has given sermons to his wives who record them and share them with the rest of the group. As his own life has grown more restrictive, his revelations have made life far more restrictive for his followers. It is rumored that he has even banned sex between husbands and wives. Not everyone has remained loyal to Warren. There are now several splinter groups with leaders of their own, such as Winston Blackmore's group and those who followed Willie Jessup out of the FLDS after Warren's sexual behavior became public knowledge. Warren's mental health has been on a roller coaster since his incarceration. He was diagnosed with several mental health conditions in the lead up to his trial. When properly medicated, Warren has expressed remorse for his actions and even told his brother to tell the people he was not the prophet. But I have been a liar. And the truth is not in me. I'm not the prophet. I never was the prophet. You are the prophet. Just a minute. The Lord's still dictating. His followers, used to Warren's erratic revelation style, believed he was just testing them, even though Warren told them. This is not We're waiting. A test. On another occasion, Warren again tried to tell the world he was not a prophet during a court appearance, but the judge silenced him. During his time in prison, Warren has gone on hunger strikes and has made attempts to take his own life. In 2011, Warren starved himself to the point of hospitalization, though he survived. A year later, he riled up his followers by being one of many who believed 2012 was the end of the world. In 2019, he conveniently had a mental breakdown just before he was to be interviewed in a deposition regarding his sexual abuse of a young girl. Despite the mountains of evidence to the contrary, Jeff's remaining followers believe he was wrongfully convicted and that he is God's true prophet and the one mighty and strong. Jeff's has left a list of victims in his wake that is thousands long. He physically, sexually, emotionally, and spiritually abused victims of all ages for many years. I believe he's partially responsible for many of the young men who have taken their lives as lost boys. He is certainly responsible for so many young girls becoming mothers as early as 13. He has ripped babies from their mother's arms and taken men away from their families. Warren Jeffs is a true dictator, tyrant, and megalomaniac. And for those reasons, he is getting a spot right here next to Herbal LeBaron. Both men are textbook examples of how dangerous religious extremism can be when power is in the hands of an out-of-control sadist. I will be back very soon with the final person who will be on the tier list, which is, of course, Cody Brown. We're going to talk about where he fits in here. You might be surprised about some of the stuff I have to say about him. Until then, have a fantastic day or night. I will catch you next time.